very much, and, uh, and good evening. Who's been here before? Quite a few. Um, well, welcome. We're going to have uh, fun. I'm, I'm quite insistent that we get going quite quickly. We're a little bit early, because I know you, you'll have loads and loads to say uh, tonight. And by the way, there are loads of people still coming in, because there are people queuing up when I arrive. My own view is just let, let as many in as you can. Um, I don't think it matters too much if the door comes open. Don't make them wait outside or in the, in the empty room. Uh, let's get them in the room. Um, so look, uh, this is very much your event. Uh, and, and what a time to be holding it in the era of um, even Jeremy Paxman being bored of politics uh, and agreeing with Russell Brand. Um, so let me introduce you to our panel, who are a lively bunch. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about them, and then we'll get straight into it. And I have no idea, other than the first question tonight, what's going to come up. So it's very much in your hands. Um, now, on the end, um, my right, your left, Nadim Zahawi is a Conservative. He was born in Baghdad, raised in East Sussex. Um, chemical engineering is what he studied at the university. He's probably one of the richest MPs in Parliament. He's made a fortune from the polling organisation, UW and various other business uh, enterprises, uh, and he's a very vocal, loyal conservative. He's the kind of bloke who comes on programs like ours uh, and defends the government line regularly. Um, and, and, and we love him for it. Um, and, uh, so that's Nadine Zahali on here. Next to Nadine is Natasha Engel, uh, who is from the Labour Party. Um, a multilingual success in the final. I'm not sure which, which language is she speaking. And a former journalist. Um, so Natasha works as a translator uh, before going through the trade union movement. And she's, she's sort of steeped in how politics works because she's uh, worked as a, as a private secretary for various um, Labour government ministers. And since 2010, she's been chair of the Backbench Business Committee. So she knows all about parliament um, and government. And the two things are not necessarily the same thing, um, but I'll, I'll let her explain that as we get on. Um, and she's, um, she's also very distinguished, and we'll, we'll get into to, to what she's done during the course of the year. Uh, next to me, uh, on this side, is Professor Baroness Young, who was a crossbench, an independent peer, so she doesn't work with any particular party on a regular basis. Um, she was appointed Baroness Young of Hornsey in the London Borough of Harrogate in 2004 as an expert on culture and the arts, particularly the visual arts. She's been a member of loads of House of Lords select committees, including the European Union Committee and the House of Lords Reform Bill Committee, uh, which is described to as tempestuous, which is probably a, a fair way of, of, of describing it. Uh, and next to um, Baroness Young is uh, Julian Hubbard, who's a Liberal Democrat. Uh, Julian's the only professional scientist in the House of Commons uh, and is a, is a big campaigner for greater scientific understanding. Um, he grew up and studied in Cambridge, he's got a PhD, uh, and he was elected in 2010, so a relatively new MP. He's a, he's a big cyclist, um, which I'm very glad about, so he chairs the all-party parliamentary group on cycling, uh, and he says he's strongly opposed to university tuition fees, uh, as many liberal Democrats were, I'm sure you remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there we are, there are panel. Um, let's get straight into our questions. And our first one's on the front row. Would you, would you like to tell do, do we have a rolling mic? Yes. Now, our first questioner has got the first question because she won a competition. So if you'd like to tell us your name, where you're from, and your question. Uh, my name is Sophia Grevenkina. I'm from Bristol. And I'll just tell you a bit about myself. I've just won a first prize for the under 18s age category. The National Council of Women's Giving Young Women and Girls a Voice competition. Everyone who entered had to answer the question if you could influence government to take action on one issue to improve the lives of women and girls, what would it be? For girls my age, there's a distinct lack of female role models in the corridors of power. So my proposal is that girls should be encouraged to aim higher in their careers and that the government should set an example by making sure there are more women in the top political jobs. I'd like to ask the panel if they think this is something that government should be done. Julie. Uh, well, firstly, congratulations, Sophia. It's, yeah, it's really good to see this happening. I look forward to you having influence on more than just one issue. And maybe you'll be here in a few years' time talking to everybody. Um, you're absolutely right um, that there is a shortage of female role models. And we see that in subject after subject. And, um, I, mean, I used to be in a physics department where it's you know, very heavily 
mail, we, we, we do quite a lot there. And we have the same problem here in the House of Commons. Um, I think you're absolutely right to say we should try to get more women into more senior positions. Um, there's some discussion. I mean, the Labour Party went down the route of having all women shortlists in order to select people, having I mean, quotas and things like that. I don't like that because I think, um, and I know a lot of women feel exactly the same, I think women should win selections and get to where they are because they are the best person for the job, not because they're the best woman for the job. I actually find that quite demeaning. Um, so I think we have to do a lot. I, within my party, I do a lot of mentoring to try to support people. Joe Swinson, who's the Liberal Democrat Minister, has done a lot of stuff. Um, on this area, trying to get more women onto boards, doing a lot of stuff on broader issues like body confidence, actually, which is quite a, a big issue if we may get onto that later. So you're absolutely right that we have to get more women there, but I want to see women getting there because they are the best. I want, you know, there are lots of fantastically able women. Uh, I've just come from a meeting with some prospective with Dem parliamentary candidates. I want them to win because they are the best person in their seat. Very much so. Ooh, well. Um, first of all, I've got to pick up on something that Julian said, if I may, because you seem to equate the idea of having um, all women shortlists with um, somehow picking an inferior being, possibly, um, uh, because you haven't got a mixed shortlist or it's not all men. The issue is, in having all women shortlists, is that there are a number of structural and systemic barriers which prevent women from being selected in the first place. So what you're doing by all women shortlist, as I understand it, is to um, try and even out the playing field. But it does not necessarily mean that somebody's not as good. Um, my own view on your question, for which thank you very much, Sophia, is that it's a very complex issue because there's lots and lots of different things that I would like to see happen, and they're kind of interrelated. And I think this issue about more senior roles is absolutely right. But I guess a shorthand for what I would say is that more women ought to have um, more information, knowledge, confidence, understanding about what their options are and being able to take those um, options and to make those choices. So some women don't want to be top of the ladder in a career, other women do. Some people, some women want to have a, a children and a career, other women don't want to have children and a career and so on. So as many women as there are, there are different choices that we need to be able to make. And at the moment, we're not in a position to make all those choices. Natasha. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd follow on from that, actually. When, when I was working in the trade union movement, we were really concerned about the number of girls that were not choosing sort of harder apprenticeships and were going, a lot of girls were choosing beauty therapy, while lots of boys were choosing engineering. And we kind of tried to find out why, why it was they were doing that. Um, and they basically, one of them were interviewing them and asking them about it. Um, it was when we told them how much an engineer earns and how much a beauty therapist earns uh, when, they, when they have their eventual careers, that the girls kind of suddenly went, oh my God, I didn't know that. And when they realised that, they actually did start thinking about doing something that, that wasn't necessarily beauty therapy. But I think it's, that's pressure at school. And that's kind of, that's peer pressure, and that people sort of, you know, the idea of a girl going into an apprenticeship that's engineering is a bit sort of, you know, a bit blokey. So I think there's a lot of work to be done at that level. Um, I think, though, a lot of the issues have just been raised here about how do we get more senior women role models and how do we get them into the corridors of power, which I think is an excellent answer to the, to the question. Um, there are really serious problems in the, in the way that we select uh, our candidates in the political parties. Having all women shortlisted is an ideal. Not having all women shortlisted is also not ideal because then you, you don't get women in. Um, I, I was selected on an all women shortlist in the next mining area. If we hadn't had an all women shortlist there, they would not have selected a woman. I mean, that's that. that I think that's a fact. Well, we're getting slightly hung up on, 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 on all women shortlist, whereas the question is about the top positions in in government, and those are positions that are in the gift of the party leader. You know, the, it's, it's not about some sort of scientific process where you have to pick the best person for the job. Well, it's basically a gift. Well, that's right. And, and in fact, if you look at the Labour benches, we've got a lot more women MPs on our side. Uh, we have got a lot of senior women on the front benches, so, so in the very senior jobs. And if we come into government, those will be, those will be the ministers. But I think that the, the question that you're asking isn't just about how do we get the more women into those senior roles. It's also about how do we get, give young women the confidence to see themselves in those roles and not think, well, that's not for me, that's for somebody else. And that's a real problem. And I think the only answer to that 
is actually women who've got senior roles in politics or in business or you know, in every other walk of life to go into schools and talk to girls and say to them, look, you know, I did it, so can you. And I think only by doing that can we really start start making changes. Do you ever lack confidence yourself? Do you ever find yourself thinking, I'm not sure I can do that? Yes. You know, it. Esther Norris was the Labour <laughs> Education Secretary of Bain, they sort of said, oh, I just don't think I'll wake up to it. Uh, 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 it was I, a terrible I, thing for I know, I know. And, uh, and, you know, she was really, people really criticised her for it. I mean, I, I thought it was actually quite a, quite a brave thing to say. But I think that's true. I think generally, um, you know, men are kind of, they, they present themselves much more confidently, and women are sort of much more, um, you know, they're, 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 they're not so thrusting. And I think we just need to get more thrusting. Speaking of thrusting, <laughs> well, you never lack confidence. I had a, a, a statistic today that, um, uh, and it was a tweet as being a, a great achievement, but actually when you think about it, it's pretty miserable. Something like uh, Parliament's had something around 340 women um, joined over 100 years. So the equivalent of you know, the 650 of us in that chamber, the equivalent of half of, of our Parliament in 100 years is what uh, we've achieved in terms of getting women on those green benches. That, I think, is, is, is um, a pretty damning diet of how good this place has been at attracting women and making them think about wanting to be parliamentarians. Um, <coughs> I sit on a board of a FTSE 250 company. And coming from the world of research, which you mentioned, Krishna, I, I observe the difference between the female member of the board and, and, and the males. You know, whenever we discuss something at, at the board, it's the woman who says, actually, you know what, I haven't quite understood that. Can you explain that again? None of the males would actually say, I haven't understood that. They always have a very, very definite view about that particular agenda item. And I think before Satna came along, you know, the sort of urban that men never ask for directions, whereas women do, uh, really emphasise the, the, the quality women can bring to any debate, to any um, piece of thinking that you need to do when you're making decisions. So do you believe ultimately in, in basically just appointing loads of women to the cabinet? I need to be positive role models. Julian says he, you know, you've got to be the best person for the job. Well, I, 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 think, I think the challenge is about filling the pipeline. Right? If you can fill the pipeline with more and more women, you will have women then gaining the experience. Because when you get here, you still need to gain the experience of one how this place works, then going through the ranks of becoming a PPS, parliamentary private secretary, a junior minister, and rising through those before you get to, to, to the front bench. Some people, men and women, by the way, have risen too quickly and found this place pretty miserable. Uh, and so I, I think the challenge is how do you fill the pipeline, not just in politics, but in business as well. You know, we talk about the boards and getting 25% of boards to be um, a, a female. I think it's also about the executives. You know, how are you bringing people through an organization, whether at Channel 4 or elsewhere, um, so that they actually think about taking a, a senior role. And a lot of that is also about the work environment. The work environment was designed by blokes, right? So we need to think about how we redesign it, re-engineer it, so that actually it works for women as well. You want to come back? Yeah, yeah. yeah. just that one, one of the things that people often say about the House of Lords is that somehow they think it's more egalitarian. Well, I'm sorry, but it isn't. And in respect of women, we have roughly the same percentage of women as uh, there are in the House of Commons. Now, I can't explain this, given that the political parties there have much more opportunity to appoint women um, if they would like to do so. And so, to me, that there are these really deep barriers that prevent men somehow, often, from appointing women to these positions. Okay, who's got an opinion on this? They want to share. Who thinks there should be more aggressive um, appointments of role models for women? Or not? Yes, there's a hand up there. Um, I totally agree there should be more women. For example, I've met a Ms. Siobhan Lita and I find her quite inspirational. I think she spoke on Women's International. And I do think there's more women out there, especially going in and out of schools, because I didn't know who she was until I met her during the working experience. And yet to speak to her a lot more, I realised if I knew about her, I most likely would have voted for her in the mail in 2012 May election. So I do think a lot of women need to be going in and out of schools, speaking to young people, and actually socialising with them. Because no one has faith in politics, no one has faith in those who are in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So we need much more um, young 
women and old people as well, but a lot more younger politicians, especially women, to actually interact with young people. Okay, who else? Yeah. You don't have to be a woman to speak next to <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Baroness is young right, that these entrenched values and environments that prevent women from really moving up when they might be the best candidate, as you would said, which is obviously the objective of an appointment. But, like Natasha said, she wouldn't have been elected. And that doesn't mean she wasn't the best candidate. It means there's entrenched values, entrenched systems, traditional misogyny, essentially, throughout all levels of society that mean women don't get appointed to these roles. So unless you force it through and it becomes the norm, then you're never going to enact that change. Like we said, we've waited 100 years that kind of culture, we haven't got it yet. 2013, we've got to really push it. Otherwise, okay. it's not going to happen. Uh, I think that was very interesting. Christian just said you don't have to be a woman to ask a question here um, for, uh, on this. Um, one of the things that's really important is also about changing men's attitudes. Um, when I was first elected, I had a toddler who was one and a half, and I had a baby a couple of weeks after the general election. Um, and certainly, I felt that that... that um, People wanted me to talk in debates about childcare. I have no interest in childcare whatsoever. It was a nightmare at home, but you know, I didn't want to talk about it at work. What I did want to talk about was kind of trade union issues, work issues, and uh, and actually, you, know, you get even once you get here, you know, education. I want you to talk about education a lot, um, and you know, welfare reform. That was my that was my my big thing. Um, and so it's really also about the men making sure that they're talking about childcare. They're talking about the sort of the softer issues. Um, and, and that way, I think, then we can really start sort of spreading the load. Do um, I mean, I think that there's another thing to say. You're absolutely right about the sort of stereotypes and trying to break them apart. And I, I used to go on Cambridgeshire County Council, and there was a new chief executive who came in who'd been a footballer. And there were three group leaders. Uh, the leader of the Conservative group was, was male, and the leader of the Lib Dems and of Labour were, were both female. So it was like, you know, started chatting to the leader of the Conservatives about football, assuming he'd be interested. Actually, both of the women were huge football fans. They really loved it. And the bloke hated football. And this guy couldn't quite understand that this was the case. So you see a lot of that. I think it starts well before even the age of any, anyone in this room. You know, if you look at, you know, it still annoys me when you see toys for girls, toys for boys. You know, there are very few toys which have to be specifically for one gender or another. Most things could be far more mixed. If you have toys that are sort of engineering y for men, then that's what they'll learn is the right thing to do. Um, and you see this. Throughout, I mean, there's, there's a lot we could talk about with this. There was a competition at Cambridge with the Student Union where they got people to hold up signs saying, you know, I need feminism because. I remember one of them um, was a, so said, because I don't want people to think that you don't look like a physicist is a compliment. Mm. Yeah, and there really is an issue in a whole lot of areas with that message. So it starts much, much earlier. Um, I'm not sure I like the idea of fitting women into the pipeline, but you know, I think it is about getting people to, to open their opportunities. Can I just pick you up on what you're saying about? not picking the best woman for the job without being passionizing, it's got to be the best person. I mean, isn't that the core of this problem? That it is largely men who decide who is the best person. Uh, the, the, this sort of idea that you can sort of have a genuinely scientific process ever in any kind of selection process and pick the best person is nonsense. It's usually down to some sort of personal opinion and personal preference. So, so why not actually just have much more of an active policy um, so you promote women, and so you've got some sort of equality. The, the, the question is how far you go. So within the Lib Dems, for example, when there is a selection process, there has to be at least one female candidate, at least one male candidate, so there's always a chance. We do a lot to try to support female candidates to stand, but we don't go as far as saying, in Cambridge, it must be a woman, it cannot be a man. We why, don't not, go, why not? Um, actually, we had a very interesting debate about that. We, we're one of, I think, the only party now which actually has debate at our conference where this was thrashed out. And it was the arguments from young women, including Jo Swinson, who was not yet an MP at the time, where she said, I'm going to become an MP by being a best person. I don't want this because I see it as patronising. Um, and that, that's the real problem. You have, I think you should do a lot to help women get in. But a huge number of young women that I talk to don't want there to be this sort of completely protected space. I think what's interesting, and Natasha, I'm sure will correct me if I'm wrong on this, but there was an article that I was reading which said that, and this may be wrong, I haven't checked this, that since Labour introduced all-women shortlists, women haven't been selected in seats where there wasn't an all-women shortlist. And I mean, that's, that's slightly more insistent. That may be wrong. I, mean, so I haven't checked it. It's just something I read. Um, so it is a really, really tough issue. You have to do a lot to get women in, but 
I just don't like the idea of saying you know, it must be that. And as I say, lots and lots of young women don't want that. Let, let's, let's change the subject, unless anyone desperate has before. Go on, briefly, just make a point. And then... um, I'd just like to agree that the deeply entrenched systems are there, because in Rwanda, which is a relatively new government, there's been no efforts to promote women particularly, but it's 51% women and peace. So, in a country like UK, we have this history with these deeply entrenched families, that is what is preventing women from rising. Thank you very much, very good point. Um, right, let's, let's move on. Now, my hint is that I think it would be a very good thing today for us to actually confront this big debate that's been going on, going on over the last few weeks uh, with the whole sort of Russell Brand nonsense about whether politics is relevant <coughs> uh, and, whether, and whether it's interesting to you. Um, we don't have to do that right now, but I think this would be a very good forum to pick that up. Who would like to change the subject? <laughs> you must have come with questions. I will come to you, but it would be nice if somebody else wanted to talk to you. But yes. Hi, uh, John Foster. Just wait for the mic. Hi, uh, I'm John Foster. I'm a trustee of the British Youth Council. Um, based on Friday's UK Parliament debate, uh, where MYPs from across the country chose votes at 16 as their campaign for the year, and that's based on 474,000 young people across the country in the major mark ballots. Do you think votes at 16 is a good way forward for engaging young people, and do you support it? Do you think uh, I don't support it, because I just don't think that at 16 you are able to evaluate um, everything that uh, government does and touches your life. Um, I think that, you know, I've got two 16 year olds at home and uh, they, they, unlike your 474,000, they, they are debated with them and they say, actually, we, uh, we agree with you. And I think uh, it's funny when we, you have to ask for parents' permission to do lots of other stuff uh, at 16. Um, and I'm not going to want to do a laundry list for you, but, you yeah, then ha having to, to be told that you should go out and think uh, that you are able to choose a government at 16 is, is, just doesn't, for me, it doesn't feel right. Just that one, just before we go, can we have a show of hands if you are 16 or above in the room? <laughs> and if you're 18, if you're, if you're over 18? Yes. So most of you are between 16 and 18. Okay, and below 16. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, so this is the core group, uh, and I will come to you in a second. Um, um, can I do a show of hands as well? Who, who supports lowering the voting age to 16? That's an easy one. <laughs> no, well, no, it's, oh, well, it's really interesting. No, no, it's, it's always... It's always like, and who's against it? Who's against it? Who's not bothered? Wow. Yeah, who's not bothered? Who's not bothered? to a lot of schools and I talk about votes at 16 a lot. I, um, I absolutely support votes at 16 and since I've been elected eight years ago I've been campaigning to lower the voting age um, and I spoke at the UK Youth Parliament um, event on, on Friday and I was delighted that that was what was chosen. Um, for me, I mean I go to schools and I talk to, and we have the show of hands at the beginning and the majority of people oppose it. Uh, for exactly the reason you said we don't think um, we are wise enough to be able to make a decision that's so important. Um, and then wise, by the end, well, no, no, that's, that's kind of, but, but oh. it's, it's, it's a sort of um, the, the, the basic reason. And then uh, by, by the end of it, when we talk about, um, first of all, what we talk about is there are elections only every five years now. So if, you're, if you just miss by one day voting, uh, by you know, 18th birthday is the day after a general election, you're knocking 23 before you get to vote for the first time in the general election. Now, nobody is advocating that we raise the voting age to 23. Um, I know plenty of 23-year-olds who are less wise and who are, you know, who, who, who would make worse decisions than a lot of 16-year-olds that I know. And what we have never, ever advocated is that you have some kind of either intelligence or wisdom test before you're allowed to, um, before you're allowed to vote in a general election. Uh, but the really, really big reason for me is that in Scotland, in the referendum next year, 16 and 17-year-olds will be allowed to vote, 
And we're saying to those very 16 and 17 year olds that the next year they will not be allowed to vote in a general election. So if they're, if they're, if they're kind of um, you know, old enough to vote in a referendum on the independence of Scotland, I think they're old enough to, to vote at 16 in a general election. Can, can you just address that point? Um, I, I mean, as I said to you, I just don't think um, you ex it's not, it's not. So what would you say to those 16 year olds in Scotland? Or otherwise, I just think it, it, you, know, you need to experience what government does. So you think that's the um, mistake? It shouldn't be I, 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 don't, I, don't, I think it's wrong. Okay. Yeah, go on, and then I'll come to the others. It's, the, it's on this, presumably. Yes. Um, sorry, I just want to, um, as um, in Parliament, um, the setting on Friday, um, people might say, oh, um, we're not old enough, we don't, like, we can't decide. But hold on, um, at 16, we can get married, we can have, we can have jobs, and yet again, you're saying we don't have, we don't have a choice to actually vote, but we do all these stuff, and so does it not mean that we do have a choice of like, making decisions in life? Okay. We as a party have espoused this for a very, very long time. There's been, I think, two bills in the last 10 years to try to have votes at 16, both proposed by my colleague uh, Stephen Williams, who's now Minister. Um, the first one was defeated uh, by the government at the time. The second one passed at that stage, but for all sorts of political reasons, ran out of time to actually happen. But it has to be the right thing to do. The argument that some 16-year-olds aren't mature enough in some way to vote applies to some 80-year-olds. I mean, it just, you know, we, we can't have it that way. Not all 16-year-olds will want to vote. But, you know, so be it. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to do. There's also a real issue that people who are older are far more likely to vote. And as a result, government policy is skewed towards people who are older. Because if you are a purely rational politician, and you can either spend some money on people who are 90% likely to vote or people who are 30% likely to vote, which will you do? And that keeps happening and keeps happening. Um, and, you know, that's why we've seen things like tuition fees go up, because there hasn't been a strong enough voice uh, from young people, you know, and I did vote against it, and I absolutely stand by that. I've opposed it since they came in. Um, but so it is really important. I, there, we had a debate about this on BBC Free Speech, if you ever watch it, and I remember one person saying, Look, I don't have time, I think she was 16 or 17, I don't have time to vote. I'm far too busy earning money, paying for petrol for my car, and getting on with life to be able to vote. I'll do it when I'm older. Um, we all have so many things to do, but if you could all vote, you, know, you may vote differently when you're 40, you may vote differently when you're 60, but we should let you vote at 16, it fits in with everything else, um, and we'd start to see more focus on issues that affect young people because there'd be more people to vote who were young and cared about young people. And if 16, why not 15? 16 is a sort of default for a whole lot of other limits. As you say, you, you can start to change your life and have much more control at 16. Um, but as you've seen, I mean, there's a campaign to lower the age of consent now. So, I mean, if that goes to 15, um, I don't think the age of consent is the only thing which defines effective adulthood. Um, let's get to 16 and we can see how that works. And you know, if, if in another 20 or 30 years' time we have a big discussion about whether it should be 15, I'm happy to have that conversation. But 16 would be a hugely fantastic thing to see. Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat what other um, uh, uh, colleagues have said. I'm in favour. I'm a relatively recent uh, convert, uh, convert to being in favour of 16 year olds having uh, the vote. And in fact, your colleague in the law, Paul Tyler, brought in a private member's bill um, at which um, I spoke on second reading a couple of weeks ago. So we had quite a lively discussion about that. Interestingly, none of the, I think only one person who was opposed uh, participated in that uh, debate. So there you go, representative of parliamentary democracy at work there. But um, I, I think the thing is, it's not, we're not going to say it should be compulsory, um, just as we don't say it's compulsory for anybody else. So if you don't feel that you're mature enough to vote, then don't vote. I only wish some of my own age group would take the same point of view, but unfortunately that's not on the cards. I think the other thing that really convinced me is when I look at all the wealth of information, of, and disinformation of course, but all the material that is there for you to discover about the world around you, whether you live in Harrow or Harringay or Hertfordshire or Harrogate or indeed Harare, you can find out everything you need to know virtually. Now I'm not saying that all that wealth of information always translates into knowledge or understanding, but I think the key point is that it can do, therefore you can find out much more about the world around you and about how things are interconnected 
and therefore affect you than we were ever able to do when we were younger. And I very much remember, I remember when um, the, there was the same sort of debate around reducing the voting age from 21, which it was when I was a teenager, down to 18, and people say, oh no, 18 year old, totally irresponsible, never want any land. Look at, look at the terrible things they're doing in the 60s. Look at them demonstrating and acting drink, drunk and on drugs and all the rest of it, exactly the same things as you hear today. And you know, we, we managed to do it. And of course, I think it's really, really important that given that you, you've got the ability or you've got the capacity, you're deemed to have the capacity to make all these really important decisions about your life, if you want things to change, then you need to vote. Okay, thank you. And let's get a smashing of audience views. Yeah, on the front row, Rick, do you um, give a mic on to that? Hi, um, I personally, as someone who's interested in politics, I feel that we're not educated that much in school about politics. Hence, the reason why we're not actually wise to vote. So I feel maybe if you were more educated in secondary school about politics, we would be more eligible to vote. So I totally agree, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's very interesting to note that um, before 1916, people actually thought that women uh, weren't capable to make the kind of decisions that um, include voting. Um, and also, I think it's fascinating that um, young people go through an entire education without having absolutely any say. For example, the changes that Michael Gove are making, um, young people don't have any say in how that's going to affect their GCSEs. And I just think that the majority of the policy that does affect us, does affect us in, in such a massive way that for us to have absolutely no say in, in how it works is, is quite frankly disgusting. And in this day and age, young people are educated, young people care, and it, it's definitely time for change. <coughs> Let's get all three of you and I'm going to some hands up over there. Okay, um, is this one? Okay. Um, my name's Tamaya. I'm um, from Diana Board. I'm also a fun week young facilitator uh, for the Women in Democracy Workshops. And I just want to say that um, obviously I've been doing workshops around the country for women and politics. And every time I've engaged with young people, they haven't got a clue about politics at all. And obviously it's because of they haven't been educated enough. Although I, I've been involved in politics since I was 10, I'm now 20, so I've been, I've been for a decade of being involved in politics. And I, I did that by being. So are you in favour or not? I, I'm in the middle. I'm yes, but I'm also no. You are a politician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been in the section 10 years. So you're the friends that come in there. <laughs> and its government and its politics because you, obviously you have so many laws you know sex at 16 driving at 17 driving at 18 you have to look over 21 or 25 to buy alcohol drugs it's just like young people are thinking why don't you make a decision either 16 or 18 why do you go in the middle for you know there's a lot of young people i speak to who ask me questions constantly constantly you know why is it 16 why is it 18 okay. can government just not just set one you know? thank you and then next year are there, are there any people who are picked who were in the I oppose it camp. So I'd like to hear from some of you as well. Okay, yeah. Hi, I'm Matthew from the Diana Award. Um, just to go back to Nadine's point about uh, young people not being able to feel the influence of government and be able to design government. And um, I think the really strong point for me is that you can get taxed at 16. So why have you got no influence over government? Get taxed at three if you're paying indirect taxes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, <laughs> the other thing as well, just to be a little bit melodramatic about it is, um, America went to war with Britain about no taxation, uh, no representation of taxation. No taxation, no taxation, no taxation it's like a really deep buzz. Yeah. Thank you. And yes, pass it along. I think another problem with uh, having people voting at 16 is like we've already said today, people can be influenced by the media to say which they should vote for. If they can be told what they're meant to look like and what jobs they're meant to have, people are going to be able to influence the one who they should vote for. So if we're going to start having people voting at 16, parties are going to be able to influence how people are voting. Well, that, that is politics, isn't it? Yeah. That's what politics is. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. But while you're still 16, you can be more easily influenced as your minds are mm -hmm. sponges, mm -hmm. as they say. When you're older, you're more easy to make choice. I'm not even 16 yet, and I've 
I can trust myself with the bike. I can see a lot of people in my own age, which I wouldn't trust with the phone. Okay. okay. All right. So you trust yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the man. As a teacher, it's all very easy to sort of say, yeah, the teacher should be educating the pupils about politics and who to vote for. Why are um, you doing it? Why aren't you, yeah. why, why aren't you educating them? Uh, my, I excuse the attachment, <laughs> but it's not a fashion um, just, just regarding sort of about the voting age, I think the wider issue for young people is not what age to vote, but um, you know, what to vote for, who to vote for. I think for many young people, the, the line between conservative, Labour, Liberal is a fictitious one for them. They, there is no difference between the parties, there is no difference between what they say and how they say it. I think, for me as a teacher, that's the wide issue. If I'm going to advise my pupils on, on what they should do and the, you know, the course they should take, of course they should vote, of course they should go out and um, express their views democratically. But the argument is will it make a difference? And, and that's what they ask me. And I just want to go. That's a big opinion about that, and actually, if that's the sort of thing you're talking to your pupils about, then that's what is turning people off. Because if you say, if you as a teacher say, there's no difference between Labour, Tory, and Lib Dem, there's absolutely no choice, they're all the same. I then if that's that. the attitude, but no, if you're saying that that's what your that's students are saying to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think if your attitude is that that's how it is, then um, I don't think that that will actually really include people. The point that was made about um, citizenship education is If really a teacher says black is white, students don't think it's right. It's no, no, so, no, no, I'm just saying that, that actually, I think if, if, in, if what we're talking about is citizenship education, which is compulsory in all schools, um, well, it was compulsory in all schools, uh, when we're teaching, is it not anymore? No. I will be a well, <laughs> well, all right. If, um, right, okay. Well, that's, that's, that is a very big problem. Um, I think what we need is instead of having um, sort of very vague citizenship education, we need to be teaching about the importance and the role of politics. And that's not only about party politics. When I go into schools, I don't talk to the pupils about. Uh, why they should vote Labour. In fact, you know, I, I, I barely mention that I'm a, I'm, I'm a Labour member at all. What I do talk to them about is what politics is and to, to demonstrate to young people that those things that they think uh, are nothing to do with them are politics. I mean, every part of your life is politics. But this so is the classic, this is your... their ignorance. It's all their fault that they're not engaged in politics. It's your fault. Right? No, that's right. That's, 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 that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. We should be going... But, um... we should be... <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we have to go into schools. But that's why also citizenship education should be well taught as a proper subject okay. to teach people what the Indeed. importance of, of politics is. Uh, I'm going to disagree with you, Natasha, on this, because I think what, uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name, Matt, Matt uh, was trying to say is, is, is borne out by the data. Um, so, you know, when I used to run YouGov, you look at evidence base, the data suggests the nation, and not just young people, but young people specifically, think we're all elite in this place. It doesn't matter what our background is, they look at us, and we don't, you know, they don't identify uh, with us. They see us all as, a, as, a, as an elite. And, and you've got you know, challenges in your party where too many are sort of get, going through you know, the research departments, you know, probably Oxbridge, and into the, the Labour uh, parliamentary party. Uh, and it's a challenge for all of us. I don't have the answers here for you. Uh, all I can really suggest is, is we should think about the problem as our problem not their fault. So you accept it's your fault? Absolutely, there's got to be, it has to be our fault. It has to be, because, you know, whether it's, it's, so you think about it's the politics where we, where the way we, 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 we never apologise, we never, you know, we don't speak like normal people speak at home. Did you, you know? apologise about your energy bill? I did, absolutely. I came out and apologised immediately, because I think it's the right, I made a mistake, it's right to apologise. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, as, as um, I said at the beginning, I'm an independent, and there's very good reason why um, I haven't joined a political party. Um, and that's be not because I think that they're all the same. I think there are differences, although I do think there's a good deal of overlap to which they're very loath to admit. But um, 
it's because there wasn't any one party that represented all the different things that I was interested in and that, could, that I felt very strongly about, which are broadly around issues of what I might call social justice, which I've thought about since I was quite small. So I absolutely relate to this idea that, you know, what are our politicians for? I think we both have, I think we all have responsibility. I don't think it's, it's a question of finger pointing at students or at teachers or even just at politicians. It's up to all of us. We made, I think we've made a real mess here of our political culture. We don't have a very strong, um, effective, um, attractive political culture. When you look at um, the way some of our politicians behave, I'm not talking about outside of parliament, I mean in relation to politics, the way they address each other, the way they talk about each other, you know, there's a very strong sense that this is sometimes all about performance, the performing being from one party. Do you, do you see anywhere that you aspire to, or, you know, anywhere that does it better? Um, in, in, terms in, the of world. Other, in, in terms of other states? Well, not. I think some countries get other bits better than we, some bits than we do. I don't think there's any one place that's ideal. And it's interesting when we talk about some of the emerging um, nations, as they're called sometimes, emerging economies who are desperately trying to institute their own form of, forms of parliamentary democracy, people are trying different things out. But I think we, we've become too settled and too complacent about our system. Well, what about Australia's style <laughs> compulsory voting? I personally don't believe in compulsory uh, voting. Um, I would believe as little as possible to be absolutely compulsory, I must say. But I know that others do. Um, um, and I think, oh, I mean, one, one thing that uh, one colleague suggested was that people should be able to write that they made a conscious decision to abstain on the voting slip and, and maybe even say why, but certainly to let um, politicians know that it's not apathy that prevents people from uh, voting, but really a kind of, I don't know what the heck to do because these people have said one thing today and then when they're in power, they change that. So, you know, how do we then trust them for the next time around? It, I, it is an incredibly difficult thing, but I think we all do have a responsibility because as soon as you say, we're not going to engage with this because they're all the same, then we're all done for, actually. Um, I mean, uh, there's a lot of other things to pick up on. I think the point about the suffragists and their campaign is absolutely right. Um, I think Clarence is absolutely right, though, that a lot of it is about the way that politics is done. And I find a lot of, particularly for the big events, really painfully rubbish at times. You know, it's very sort of nitpicky. You have a sort of fake debate with people putting on a role to argue it. Now, actually, when you turn the cameras off, most MPs are able to talk to each other in sensible ways and actually work together. But as soon as you turn around, this really hit me with there was a debate about youth unemployment. And basically everybody from the government side was saying it's the last government's fault because it shot up during that time and things were going well. Everybody from Labour side was saying no, it's this government's fault because it hasn't come down. And I was chatting to a, a Labour MP who, who I get on very well with, sort of outside it. And we, I think she said to me, or I said to her, I don't remember now, nobody's actually talking about what we're going to do about it. It's all about whose fault is it not about what do we do. And you see this time and time and time again. And I think if we're going to re-energise people, we have to talk much more about values, <coughs> about principles, rather than exact details of whose policy said what and which percentage didn't it. You know, so many things that actually get talked about are not the most important things that matter. It's very hard to step back out of that and get into that values discussion. Uh, it's what I try to do when I talk in schools. And frankly, what somebody was saying about people getting better and more independent when they're older. I find the very best questions I ever get are at schools. Mm. They're the most thoughtful, people who really take the time to get engaged. This is exactly what uh, David Cameron, and that's been what all the parties said after the last election. Oh, you know, we've got to make Prime Minister's questions more intelligent, we've got to stop mm. the, you know, the Yabu politics. And three years on, it's all back to the same old thing. Well, you've got, I think Julian's right to say that the big set piece pieces are, you know, more theatre than real debates. And actually, you know, if I think of my own experience on the Business Innovation Skills Select Committee, and you look at the way select committees behave, they actually do a pretty good job. Uh, you know, Margaret Hodges' committee has done some excellent work in the last three years holding the government to account. And it's, you, know, you tend to have consensus. It, you know, it's very rare that a select committee would split on party lines. Uh, the reports are very powerful, taken very seriously by the executive, by government. Um, and actually, if, if the public would watch more of the select committee, or if we can have highlights of that, 
or make it more interesting, you know, get some good broadcaster like Channel 4 or someone to make it more interesting, um, then you might get a very different opinion of the space. Uh, and so it's not all sort of doom and gloom. I think there's some really good work. You know, you set my mind thinking, you said, you know, what other countries do it well? I actually thought, you know what, our select committees are pretty good at it. Um, the new innovation under Natasha, she could talk more about it, the, the Backbench Business Committee, where I've had experience going before that committee where we, you put forward an idea that you want to debate, and it's taken really seriously, and people actually turn up and debate it. And outside the space, people come up to you and say, oh, you know, that's a really good thing that you did there. I, mean, I, I, with many colleagues, looked at the recognizing what happened to the Kurds, genocide. Uh, and we had an excellent debate, I thought, that day in the chamber. And you find lots of other colleagues uh, who had their, you know, their own experience with the Backbench Business Committee being very good. So I think there's lots of good things. It's how do we then communicate those out to the rest of the country? Yes. You're on the second row. Where's the microphone? Could you, could you come around to the front and then just pass it across? Um, I think a, 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 a problem we should be addressing is um, that there's a great divide between what people believe about which party they should choose. I mean, it's a very common perception if you're working class, you choose Labour. If you're upper class, you choose Conservative. But should it more be done to help? Younger, children, younger people in our generation to educate them more about which party they should choose and not just because of their social background. By who? Who do you want to do it? Well, I think that it should, it should be done further and it should be incorporated into our youth, into the education system, and it should become compulsory because once we do this, then we'll have more knowledge about what to do in our future and possibly encourage people to make the right decisions. Okay, yeah, it's a second. Also, I mean, you also talk about, obviously, you talk about vote 16, but you've still got age restrictions being an MP and the youngest member of the House of Lords is in his 30s. So, surely, if you're going to get voted 16, you need to get MPs at 16. And I think one of the problems which you're sort of addressing is the fact that politicians now make a career in Parliament. And what we really need, I think, is, um, is turnovers. We need more turnover. People just get to Parliament and sit in a safe seat for decades sometimes and lose touch. In reality, I think if you had an MP or one of the House of Lords who was there for a set amount of time, you know, and then you could have a situation where you get more of a turnover, of different people coming in. One of the big problems we get, I think, in politics is people coming straight out of the university, not really having experience, go straight into a policy unit, straight into, uh, into a political party. It's the, the lack of representation. I mean, Let's just pick that up just in, in a couple of words. Do those of you who are in favour of votes at 16 also think you should have parliamentarians at 16? Um, I, I, I can't see any reason why not. We are currently allowing people to stand at 18. Which, which means, whether people would want to vote for a 16-year-old is another question. I'll happily um, leave that to it. You're absolutely right to highlight the problem, by the way, of professional politicians. It is a huge increase. Um, the two growth areas are professional politicians, people who've been in media and PR. And I think that's really damaging. because it, They're both jobs where it's all about spin and what something looks like. We're actually seeing fewer lawyers, fewer people who've ever had a, a manual job, fewer scientists, fewer engineers, you know, things where it actually matters if something works. How long do you want to stay in MP? Uh, well, I think that depends on the people of Cambridge. No, but um, I mean, given if they, if they would, if you were in a safe seat, or if you made it a safe seat, <laughs> would you stay there forever? Uh, I certainly wouldn't stay there forever. I don't know. I mean, at the moment I'm focused on trying to get re-elected. It's not a safe seat. In Costa Rica, if you are an MP, it is illegal to stand at the next election. You have to take a gap. And then you can stand again at the election after that, and then you have to have a gap. Would you spoil that here? I don't think it would work here. Um, <laughs> but, but it, but it, but it, I mean, Costa Rica has a lot of other things. They got rid of their military ages ago and spent the whole money on, on education. It's a very, very different place. I think there are problems, but I think the problem is actually more about safe seats. And the fact that we do have lots and lots of people in the Commons, and effectively everybody in the Lords, who isn't really <coughs> accountable. Because they get their seat, they are there forever, whatever they do. And that is a huge, huge problem. It means they're less and less in touch with what happens. I have to say, we don't have very many safe seats in the lived end, so we haven't quite had to encounter this problem in the same way. But it is a real issue. It means that seats are given okay. much more by patronage rather than by public accountability. Natasha? Um, yes, absolutely. If you have a low voting age of 16, then 16 year olds should be able to put themselves forward for a parliament, absolutely. Well, what about limiting the number of terms you can? The, the, there's a couple of problems with that. One of them is, um, in order to get that passed as a law, you'd have to get MPs to vote for it, <laughs> <laughs> which is highly unlikely. Um, 
I think uh, th th those are all really interesting ideas about kind of getting a bigger turnover. There's another problem, I think, um, certainly if you do it, uh, once you become an MP, um, I'm, I'm in a marginal seat as well, so um, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant worry about whether you're going to lose your job, and then what do you do at the end of it? You, you lose your job, and, and that's it. You know, the next day you wake up and you don't have a job, um, so you have to go and find something else. So it's incredibly insecure. So you know, just in terms of your livelihood, I don't think many people would be able to be MPs if that, if that was the deal. Yeah, it's a secondment, some of that people Yeah, I mean, the, but, and, and those are all really, really good ideas, and I think what, what this is, what this is striking at is the fact that we've got a much, much bigger problem than just about whether we've got career politicians or how that's happened. Or well, that's, 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 that's right, that's right. And I think also things have changed so dramatically, even in the eight years that I've been here. I mean, I went on Twitter on Friday for the first time, kind of joined the 21st century finally. Hey. But <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but I think the way that we communicate and the way that we do things and the way that we campaign on different issues are actually something that we really need to look at. Your issue about the difference between the political parties, I think at one level that, that is maybe right, but I think it's it's more the fact that we all look very similar. When I was at the UK Youth Parliament on, on, uh, on Friday, it was really evident that the ethnic mix and the gender mix was like nothing we had. You know, I mean, we're, we're largely male and white in, in the House of Commons, so we don't really reflect the people that we represent. Um, and so really we need to look at much, much wider issues um, than just about the political parties because actually I think what, it's, what, what politics is coming down to now is much more issues based rather than sort of ideologically based and I think we need to look at that as well. Nadine, Nadine, I mean, do, you, do you think about how long you want to do this? I mean, do you think it's a turn off for people to see the same old faces turning in year in year out? No, I, I think you should have recall. I think Zach Goldsmith has, has, has been you know, championing this this issue. Um, I think you know, local people feeling that you know, they can change their member of parliament um, is a good thing. I think having people from varied backgrounds, experience outside this place, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be just sort of, you know, business or you know, being an entrepreneur or an engineer, you know, people who've worked in social work and, and teaching, whatever profession, uh, coming into this place is a, is a really, really positive thing um, to have. And so, you know, we can make real improvements, but I, but I agree with Natasha in the sense that if you think you're, you're working on and doing a good job, I mean, to, to, to sort of you know, have that cut short just because you know, people think, well, change is a, is, is a good thing. I don't, you know, I don't think people will necessarily get a better uh, representative in this place if that happens. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when we were going through the House of Lords reform, because you, you mentioned the, the House of Lords, where, where famously the average age is 70, and where um, we're appointed for life. I mean, you know, even if you commit com criminal offence, you, you can't be sacked from the House of Lords. That's the situation we're in, because we, we didn't sort of support reform. But it was really interesting during that process of uh, looking at the bill and, and soliciting comments from people. And when, when you talk to the, when, I think I'm right in saying in the polls, I don't know if you can remember, Nadine, what, what some of these were like, but what, they seemed to, what the public seemed to be saying was that they didn't want um, elected House of Lords because it would be just like the common, Commons, and that's a bit of an indictment. They just didn't want it to be like the Commons. What they wanted were people who were independent-minded, who had um, experience of different kinds of workplaces, and who had current, up-to-date practice and experience, but they wanted them to be accountable. And so we, we've got a little bit of some of those things, but not enough to compensate for not being accountable. So it goes back to the point I think that Natasha was sort of reiterating, which is that a whole system needs to be rethought, and that's such a big thought that people just can't get their heads around it, I think. Yes, who else? Go on then. Can we, oh, sorry, I did say you as well, didn't I? But um, do you first? Just talk to me next to you. Um, I was just wondering, um, like, I personally think we need more young people in politics. But, but in fact, because we have um, the UK Parliament, but I think the real problem starts at, in education, goes back to the point. Um, I, like, I know some um, 18 and 20 year olds that actually don't know who David Cameron is. And I find that really, really 
Wow, because that's that's why we need politics and education. I I'm I'm 14 years old now, and when I, I'm going to turn now, um, when I um, in year eight, I've only learned about politics once. Okay. That's, that's all. I should say. Thank you very much. We are actually going to have to let Nadine go because um, he's got to go off and do something. But uh, can we can we just thank him for joining? Very Really, really important. Okay. Let's, let's 
Should we change the subject? Anyone want to change the subject? Yes. Look at that. We've got, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to ask everybody to be brief. Uh, this is a question particularly relevant to Dr. Uh, as uh, someone, a cycling enthusiast, or someone who's passionate about safeguarding and sustaining the future, what do you think should be done to minimise uh, cycling deaths in central London and to promote cycling for young people? Because if we pass on the contrast of the nations like the Netherlands, that young people and for adults, cycling is at the number one factor of transport, where a single line on the list. Okay, let's probably go beyond London, shall we? I mean, <laughs> and, and there, are, there have been six deaths in the last two weeks, which is why it's a particular London issue, but I mean, it's a national issue. Um, I mean, you know, it, it has been horrific what's happened in London, and um, there's a lot of work being done on the specific causes of each one. But there's a huge amount we can do, and it's really important to get people to cycle and to walk. I mean, I think both of those are really important. You're much healthier if you cycle or walk to school, to work, whatever it might be. They are generally safe things to do. Um, rather give a really long answer, we did a big inquiry, which I led for the All Party Cycling Group, um, where we produced a report called Get Britain Cycling. So if you want the long answer, there are, I think, 18 recommendations there. Because like, Natasha very kindly agreed to let us have two debates, one about a year ago before we did this, one afterwards. And it was incredibly well attended. We managed to get about 100 MPs to come and talk about why we needed to support cycling to make it safer. But the, the arguments are fantastically clear, that if you get people to cycle and walk more, they are healthier, which saves us money, the congestion goes down, people learn better, people work better, it's fun, it's really good. You know, it's, it's just a great so but but how how about how to make it safe. So, I mean, as I say, there's lots of details in this report, but some of the key things to make sure on main routes we have segregated cycle facilities. So not just some paint of any colour on the side of the road, but proper segregation. There's also um, having slower speed limits, so 20 mile an hour speed limits are really effective. Training car drivers and HGVs in particular to be aware of cycles, making that part of the test makes a big difference. But also about cycle training in schools. I'd like to see every school teaching people how to ride and how to do so safely and legally. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, I have been cycling in London since I, I, I studied in London, so um, I started at 18, and uh, two years ago I got knocked off my bike, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a terrifying experience. I'd never had an accident to, uh, uh, until then. Um, and so I stopped cycling for two years, and I'm just about to start again. But I mean, I've got no confidence. It's absolutely terrible. I think what two terrible years time to start. I know. <laughs> I'm, I've got put on a stone. That's just vanity. But, um, but actually, I uh, I grew up in Berlin, and uh, they have got completely separate cycle routes. So it's you've got the pavement, a cycle route, and then you've got the the road. And I can't see anything other than that route working. In Amsterdam, where they've got a lot of cyclists, they've got so many cyclists that actually it's very difficult for car drivers to use the roads. That might be another okay. answer: is that cyclists just drive um, car users off the road? But I think actually, um, I think the only way to do it is by having separate cycle roads. Thank you. Are you a cycler? Um, I was. Um, uh, uh, just slow foot stopped me. I'm not going to appear for or anything. But, and also, I'm a great walker, I love to walk. But I think that's part of the issue because to me, it's about an integrated um, approach to how we get people out of their cars because that is an issue. Although the, these latest accidents are all involving big vehicles, buses, and lorries, and they are incompatible on the road. And, you know, we can add Copenhagen to the list of yes. cities that has really cycle friendly um, places. And I have to say, last time I was in Copenhagen, um, the cyclists are very polite. And they stop at red lights <laughs> and they don't kind of harass you. But I think that's part of the, um, the uh, it's, it's an effect of the relationship between cars and cycles. It's not because I don't think they're inherently more polite people, but because there isn't that contestation between cars and cycles. So therefore, cycle, cycles don't feel they have to take it out on them. The questions on the page. Thank you. Um, we've got another question. Let's take this one here on the page. Hi, my name is Kay Hennessy. I'm a student at Edmonton Secondary School. And I just wanted to um, put forward about what happened to like prison rights. And um, so in like the 18th to 19th century, they people, people who committed people who committed a crime went to prison and they had wooden beds, no mattresses, no toilets, no luxuries like they do now. And um, basically, the majority of people, I'm not kind of stereotyping here, but the majority of people um, rob because they've got no money, no house, 
um, they basi basically got nothing to lose. And they get into prison and they've got these beds, three square meals a day, TV, games rooms, and stuff like that. So basically their life is heaven compared to what it was when they were robbing. And um, so and on, the su and on the subject of prison... Is there, is there a question? Um, <laughs> what happens to like all the prison rights? I mean, why have they suddenly just got all these luxuries?
They're also from people with mental health problems who spend far too much time there. People who are autistic, spectrum, tend to be in there far too often. There's a whole lot of people. Um, and what we know, particularly about short-term prison sentences, is that people who do a short-term sentence are incredibly likely to reoffend afterwards. And partly that's because we're still not very good at dealing with them when they leave. We say, you know, you're now out, go and find a job quickly, having just come out of prison. And amazingly enough, it's quite hard to find a job, so people have no money, so they go back through, uh, through the because they've been in prison. And because they're 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 trying to employ them. And we're, we're trying to get some changes to rehabilitation offenders after that takes some time. Mm. I think far fewer people should be in prison, particularly for short-term sentences. There are much better things like restorative justice, where you bring people and you give to talk to the victims. It doesn't work for all crime. There's some way it couldn't be done. Where both parties want to do that, to talk about the damage that was done. And lots of researchers found that reduces reoffending far more than prison. It's cheaper, which is great, but it's also victims prefer it to the person being in jail. So if you have something that's cheaper and more effective and preferred by victims, that strikes me as a much more sensible thing to do. Um, I'd like to see far more of it. Just to tie back into previous conversations, maybe it's slightly controversial, I think prisoners should be allowed to vote as well. Mm. Because when they come out, I want prisoners to be reintegrated into society. I don't want them to see themselves as <coughs> completely separated, because if they see themselves as separated, they are more likely to reoffend. Let them vote. Many of them won't, but some of them will, and they'll have that chance to think they have a stake in society. That's a deeply uncontroversial position. I think we had a vote on it, and there were 22 MPs on my side and hundreds on the other side. I vote with you. Fantastic. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it sorted then. Uh, but that, to me, is a much better way of reducing it. It's the erosion of European Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a bit, yeah, your opinion is very clear, you can't ban everybody. So maybe that short-term prisoners are allowed to. Anybody want to talk about this or, or, or all the hands on different topics? Because we haven't really had time for another topic. So if, if you want to comment on this, then yeah. Sorry, it's a bit of, it's slightly Well, go on, just, um, I can't guarantee to put it to the panel. Um, just a, a question on university fees because I know that, <laughs> that the, um, the amount of students I've actually gone to university have actually dropped by quite a significant amount. I think about 428,000 have gone to university this year. So um, I think it's been risen about nine grand. How is it going to change? Will it change? I'm going to leave that one hanging, I'm afraid, because it's a really, really big one. <laughs> and um, yeah. uh, we don't have time. Yes, yeah, so I don't really have time to put anything to the panel unless it's really, really snappy. But I'm going to let you make some comments or raise some questions just to hang in the air. I just want to ask, if we leave the EU, which the government has promised uh, a referendum, how will that impose our daily functioning, our daily life? I didn't hear the last part. Sorry. If you left the EU, how would that uh, uh, impact our day-to-day -day lives? One word answer. <laughs> has anyone got a one word answer? It would, it would be a disaster. It would be a disaster. <laughs> Job, the jobs out the window, economy stalling, would be a huge, huge problem. Really, really bad thing to do. I, uh, I, think, I think the issue is about having a referendum, though. I, okay. I have voted to have a referendum because I think we're now in a position where um, this issue, everybody is talking about it, but they're not allowed to have a vote on it. So whether they vote yes or no is up to them. But I think it's, it's time that we went back to people and kind of said, look, it's so different now from how it was in 1975. We need to confirm whether or not this is what we want. And on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you very much indeed for all your questions and all your attention.